Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you very much for joining me for this podcast, and I have the special privilege of being able to interview Tim Stevens. Many of you have probably heard his name. Tim is the pastor of Fairview Baptist Church in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And Tim, along with James Coates, uh, was one of the pastors who has been uh, arrested. Uh, Tim has actually been arrested twice uh, through all of this situation with COVID and the Alberta Health Agency and their ordinances and all of that stuff. And um, many of you, most of you watching my channel, have, have probably seen the interviews that I've done with James and maybe been a bit more familiar with with uh, James Coates and his situation. But Tim has gone through much the same thing. And uh, he has been a tremendous encouragement to me as I have watched him and how he is not only the stand that he has taken, but just the way in which he has carried himself, uh, his demeanor, his care for the flock, uh, been a great encouragement to me. And I know that he will be to you as well. So Okay, dear ones, I'm going to interrupt myself here for just a second, and I want to let you know something about the end of this video. So after the interview was over, Tim and I talked for a few minutes afterwards, and it was still recording. Now, normally, I mean, it's very common when I interview someone, we, you know, exchange some pleasantries at the end or whatever that's not included in the in the video that I post. Uh, so we, Tim and I talked for a few minutes, and uh, as I watched that later... I thought, you know, I'm just going to leave that in there. So there is some behind the scenes footage, if you will, towards the very at the very end of this video. So I do watch this all the way through to the end. I'm, I'm going to include that um, behind the scenes stuff because I think even that uh, will encourage you. So anyway, uh, be looking for that towards the end. Tim, brother. Thank you so very much for coming on to the program. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Tim, you are the pastor at Fairview Baptist Church in Calgary. And um, before we get into the legal situation, all that, that has transpired, give us just a, a little bit of an overview about yourself, who you are, maybe a kind of a bird's eye view of your testimony and how long you've been at uh, Fairview. Yeah, I grew up in, in Eastern Ontario, uh, here in Canada, and then actually came out to, to Calgary in 2004, I had just finished university in 2002, and, and uh, by no means was, was church, Christianity, ministry, anywhere on the radar for me. I came out here to Calgary because uh, we are oil and gas, sometimes we're called the Texas of the North, and so I uh, was, was here and working as a, as a software engineer, writing software for oil and gas companies. And it was actually in, in 2006 that a, a message was sent to me and to my, 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 my current girlfriend and soon to be wife, Raquel, and someone sent us Paul Washer's shocking youth message. And that just began to open our eyes. And we, we started listening, looking for more Paul Washer. We found John MacArthur and I read his book, Gospel According to Jesus at that time too. And that was, it really removed the, the veil over my eyes where I thought, you know, Christianity was you pray a prayer, ask Jesus in your heart, and then you go on your way. Um, so that really presented me with what, what the true gospel is, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And it was still a process of, of God dealing with us and with our sin. And so it was at 2008 that um, we could tell by, by our love for the church, our love for the word, and, uh, and just a, a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that, that God had saved both my wife and myself. And, uh, and we experienced a change in our desires and, and what we wanted to do with our lives. This wasn't long before God gave me a, a desire to want to tell everybody about, about the gospel and what it truly was. And so uh, I got counsel from, from the pastor of a church we were going to then in Calgary saying, you need to go to school. And uh, so I went to Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary for three years from 2010 to 2013. And then when I was finishing that up, um, I, I, we, had, we had friends who were attending Fairview Baptist in Calgary who uh, who asked if I was done school, and so their pastor had just resigned, and so I applied, thinking that well, I was I was new to the faith, and and this would be my first pastorate. But uh, the church flew me out to Calgary uh, from from Detroit area, and 
um, I had, had a good number of weeks with them. And so I, I started ministry as a pastor at Fairview Baptist Church in January 2014. And uh, the church was, was much smaller then than it is now. And it was, uh, there was a number of issues uh, that the congregants identified to me as I came. But, but my, my goal was simply to preach uh, the truth, preach God's word section by section, and, uh, and allow God to, to mold and transform and to change his church. And by God's grace, he's done that over the years. And then, of course, these last number of months, uh, our church has been brought more into the limelight as, as we've just continued to meet and, and to do the very things that, that we've sought to be doing over the last number of years. Be faithful to God's word. Be faithful in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the power of expositional preaching. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's the word of God that changes people, that shapes, uh, shapes the church and keeps the church healthy. So uh, praise the Lord for that. Well, Tim... Um, so you've you've been in the news uh, quite a bit. So give us give us kind of um, the cliff note version. I know there's probably a lot of details, but how you came to uh, run afoul with the powers that be, the the government there in Canada and COVID. Uh, there are many overlaps. In fact, you and James Coates know one another, correct? And are friends. That's right. That's right. Uh, we were acquaintances. Uh, before all this happened, and of course, our friendship has grown uh, over this time as we've, as we've walked a very similar path. Understandable. But, but here in Canada, COVID restrictions came upon us in, in March of 2020. And so March 15th was our last Sunday. That was, was somewhat normal. And, and the predictions here in Alberta, we have four and a half million people here in Alberta. And the predictions here were that 30,000 or more were going to die because of COVID. And so uh, seeing images from Italy and from China, uh, our church followed every, almost everybody else where we uh, began to, to scale back our services for the safety of our own congregants. And so for a number of weeks uh, at the end of March and through April, uh, we weren't meeting. Uh, we, were, we were just communicating with each other online, yeah. but it became apparent that the virus was not as they had said it was going to be. And, and it just wasn't that the crisis that they had predicted. Mm -hmm. And there was a hungering for our church to be back together and to be with one another and so we had we had a few um, congregational meetings, and I actually wrote an essay for our church about the importance of gathering, looking looking at the at the, the people of Israel in, in in Egypt when Pharaoh was seeking to define the terms of worship. The same thing happening in Babylon with Daniel and uh, with his acquaintances there, and then again yeah. um, in Rome when whenever the Pharisees sought to to command the disciples what they can or cannot say. And so we had, we had, I kind of led the congregation through that and the majority of our congregation was in support. And so before we received official permission from our government uh, or allowance to, to meet again, we started meeting again um, in May of, of 2020 and uh, we, we just continued meeting and there was, we didn't make a big fanfare, a big deal of it. And so as, as we met through the summer months, of course, restrictions a bit eased during the summer. And then as, as fall continued, we continued to gather without requiring people to wear masks or not, or distance or not. We just allowed people to come according to their own convictions. Right. And then things really, really got um, publicized, I guess, in, in, in January. Um, there was complaints made against our church because our parking lot was, was still full, even though we weren't supposed to have many people in our church. And so in January, uh, police came and, and gave me a fine at that point, just a $1,200 fine. And uh, as we continued to gather, uh, the, the consequences that the authorities continued to level increased. And so I've received a number of, of not fines, but rather court summons where, where a judge would actually uh, decide the penalty uh, for disobeying the Public Health Act. And that can range from up, up to $100,000. And up to five hundred thousand for repeat offenses. So I've I've got about six or seven of those, and then they they stopped doing that. My goodness. And then it, it was, uh, and we continue continue to meet. Um, and th through this time, we we had turmoil within our own congregation as we had differences of opinion, and we lost some people, even in people in our leadership. Um, but as as our resolve grew, uh, because uh, through all this time, we we just became more and more convinced that because Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and that He is. Uh, the Lord of his church and the church is his bride. And, and he determines how the church gathers and worship that we, we need to obey Christ rather than men. And so our convictions in that area strengthened until in, in May, after one church service, 
Uh, the police were outside and like they were on most Sundays observing our, our services. And uh, after that Sunday service in May and May 16th, they, they arrested me in the parking lot, uh, brought me to jail or in, in prison where I was there for three days. And uh, eventually the, the charge for that particular Sunday was dropped because they had uh, the police had, had wrongfully given a court injunction to somebody else and not to me personally. And so after I was released, they, they, they regave me that court injunction to me personally. They did it right that time. And uh, they also locked up our, locked up our building. That's uh, similar to Grace Life Church. They didn't put right. fences around our, our church, uh, but they did change our locks and uh, prevented us from accessing our building. And so for the month of June, we met outside. And it was one of those meetings uh, that the police were, were surveilling us, with, even with a helicopter. Um, and they came to my house on Monday uh, to arrest me for one of those outdoor meetings because okay. the outdoor gathering limit at that time in Alberta was 10 people. And so we were over that and we still were not requiring people to distance or wear masks. And so they arrested me. And then I, I spent uh, 18 days in prison until the restrictions here um, were loosened on July 1st. And so I was able to come out because that court order was rescinded on that day. Uh, so I spent most of the month of, of the la at least latter half of June uh, in jail because of, of meeting together and, and facilitating the meeting of our, our church. Wow. So even though you were meeting outside, they still, they said you could only have 10 people gathered for an outside meeting. That's right. And, and the, the week following, um, so, so the, the week following the restrictions were supposed to change to 150 outside. And so we thought that because the restrictions were easing, there was probably very little chance that they were going to continue to ratchet up the enforcement. Um, but they, they decided, and, and in here in Canada, everyone passes the buck. So the politicians say this is not their call. It's the call of the police. The police say it's not their call. It's the call of the Alberta Health Services. And so everybody um, tries to shift the blame about who is actually running the show um, on, on this enforcement. But it was surprising that even at the end of June, where our COVID numbers were incredibly low, where an outside gathering is, is next to zero chance of COVID transmission, that, uh, that they right. would still want to arrest me and put me in jail uh, because of, of gathering for church, um, which is incredible. Unbelievable. It, it just uh, I never cease to be amazed at, at the logic of not only government authorities, but just a lot of people in general through all of this. It's just um, dumbfounding to me. Uh, but the notion of, of arresting you for meeting outside, as you said, I mean, it, it, chances of transmission of COVID or any other virus for that matter outside is practically zero and uh, just unreal. Just well, that's right. And in, in both of my arrests, uh, we, we have never as a church had an outbreak of COVID. A few of our members have, have, uh, have, have gotten COVID over, over this past 16 months, but there's never been any transmission within our church. Uh, we have, we haven't harmed anyone. We haven't sent anyone to the hospital or to the intensive care unit. Yeah. And so all this enforcement is for, for what may happen. And uh, it seems that specifically they, they choose to, to pick on churches and pastors here in the province, even though there are so many who, who don't uh, follow the rules and even, even our own premier, um, similar to a governor in the state, uh, he's the head, the head of our province. Right. Uh, even even he was caught red-handed breaking the rules uh, with an outdoor gathering that didn't follow the guidelines, but yet, uh, of, co of course, no consequences for him. No rules for thee, but not for me. <laughs> I know we, <laughs> we've seen that down here in the states too. Uh, Governor of California, Gavin Newsom, has been caught on camera multiple times violating his own uh, restrictions and protocols and guidelines and all that. And it, yeah, it's just the hypocrisy is astounding, but yeah, your premier didn't spend any time in prison, but, but you did. That's right. That's right. And it's hard to believe that I've been, I've been there twice, uh, twice, been to prison right. twice as a pastor, you know, so it's, uh, in my, my kids are getting used to it. They say, daddy, when you go back to prison, you know, um, that they're anticipating oh. that to happen again. Uh, they just think this is, this is what the police do. They, they come and they're looking for pastors and it, it's incredible, uh, that this would be happening. I, I never would have imagined this, uh, in a million years to, to happen uh, in a country like ours, especially because of, uh, of a public health rules yeah. that they would be enforcing this way. Yeah. 
that is heartbreaking to, uh, to hear you say that your kids say, daddy, when you go back, that is heartbreaking. Unbelievable. Um, Tim, tell us a little bit about your family. So you have eight children. Is that correct? Yeah, we have eight children from the ages of 12 down to six months. And uh, so kids that are, that are full of joy, we have the pleasure of, of schooling them at home and uh, teaching them about all the, all the things that are going on in our world today and the things that are uh, going on in, with COVID right now. So, so they're, they're well aware of, of history in the past and of governments who have, have asserted this kind of control over the population before. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that has been a, a teaching moment for them. They've been able to see their parents uh, live out the faith and their convictions to follow Christ, no matter the cost. Yeah. Amen. And, and, you know, I told James the same thing. I think you saw the interviews that I did with him. I, mm. I said one of the, you know, not that, that what happened to you or to James was a good thing in and of itself because it wasn't, but, but God works all things that individually are not good, but he works them out altogether for the good. Uh, but, but one of those things that, um, one of the good fruits that will be born from this is, is his kids, nor your kids, your kids will never have to wonder, do mommy and daddy really believe what they say? Does daddy really believe what he says on Sunday mornings behind the pulpit? Does he really believe that? It's a, there's no question. You have lived that out. They've seen you live out what you profess to believe. And uh, boy, the, the impact that that will have on your children is just um, incalculable. No, that's right. Because we've, our children, we sought to have them and said that the modern day secular heroes, the heroes that, that they have are, are men like John Bunyan or, or Jim Elliott <laughs> or these people in the past. And so to be able to see that happening today with either right. own father or James Coates or others, it has really put uh, but flesh on the bones of, of some of these men who have gone before us, who, who have paid much higher prices and have been in much more difficult circumstances. Yeah. But it's, it shows them that that followers of Jesus are, are serious about putting Jesus. He is Lord. He is King. And we, right. we, we obey right. him over every other authority. And Absolutely. so it's important for them to see that. Yeah. And it's not that it, it's not that you don't have respect for the governing authorities. It's not that you don't obey the governing authorities, but when it comes to the church, the government uh, does not have authority in the church. That's uh, right. The church belongs to Christ and, and all authority, uh, all authority belongs to Christ. So any, uh, any authority that any other earthly institution would have, would have, would, it would be authority that has been delegated to it by Christ. And that's right. So and, go, and, and, and in the last year, in the last year, um, people have, have accused me of being overly political, but I, I think what, what has happened in this past year is, is not that the church has become more political. It's that our government has become more religious. Uh, they're now dictating the uh, terms of worship. They're dictating marriage yes. and sexuality. They're, they're, they're doing um, the very things that God has, has called us to do. Yes. And so we, we have to uh, speak into these issues and we have to obey God first. Yes. I love the way you put that. It's not that the church has become more political, but, but the government has become more religious. Mm -hmm. Wow. I like the way you put that. Um, so Tim, in the, in the weeks leading up to this, as, as tensions kind of ramped up between you and the, and the government there, um, I asked you this last night, so I know the answer to it, but uh, you, you know, and I talked the last night, but for, for those watching, was there ever a time as, uh, it, as things got more serious and you and Raquel, am I pronouncing your name correctly? That's right. Raquel. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, did you and Raquel in the conversations that y'all had, was there ever a temptation to say, you know, we don't like what the government is doing. We don't like this, but you know, let's just, play along, hold our nose, do the best we can. We'll, we'll have online services until things get back to normal and just kind of bend our knee to Caesar, even though we don't like it, but um, let's do it to avoid being persecuted. Let's do it to avoid me going to, to prison. Was that ever a, a temptation? 
No, that w- it wasn't a temptation with, with the increasing enforcement by our secular authorities. I, th- I think the biggest turmoil that Raquel and I went through was back in January when, when our story first hit the news and it was on secular media. And a number of people in our community, our city, in our country uh, were sending us hate mail and, uh, you know, writing comments on our Facebook page and, and just um, you know, saying thing that we're so despicable and we're, we're, we're ruining everybody and we're hurting our community. And, uh, and even having uh, so much vitriol from other Christians, uh, a variety of stripes, saying that we're a, such a terrible testimony to Jesus. There was actually an article published by a, by a pastor who, who's a mega church pastor here in our city. Uh, who said that myself and, and James Coates and others uh, who are open are blaspheming Jesus' name uh, mm-hmm. by, by being open and not following the government during this time, and so so that was that was difficult, but it, it didn't really change our 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 demeanor, our resolve. But when we had internal turmoil within our own congregation because of all the negative attention that really caused a number of people in our congregation to have second thoughts about our, our course of action. We had a number of people who stopped attending. We had, we had leaders who were, who were um, just not so sure whether this was the best course anymore. And, and those internal conversations became so difficult. And we wanted to, as best, best we can, uh, try to accommodate all of our brothers and sisters whom we so dearly loved uh, before this happened. And so that, that really gave us um, just really internal consternation, trying to deal with, with the internal strife within these, these brothers and sisters that you've, that you've ministered with uh, for years. Yeah. Um, but then we realized that it just was impossible to, to satisfy everyone that there is like this, this issue has, has presented people on, on different sides. Right. And so we had to stick with, with our, with our convictions that we even had before uh, enforcement increased and uh, in, in fact, we just we sought to clarify with with my teaching and such um, through through emails and through preaching. Just try to solidify with our church why we're doing what we're doing. And so that way, as enforcement increased, um, we we were already committed to our our principles. We were already committed to the doctrines that we were going to stand on. And so we didn't know how far it was going to go. Uh, but but each step, we we kind of counted the cost. So when they when they said when they essentially issued me, you know, six or seven of these court summons that carry hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. Uh, Raquel and I had to sit down and say, are we willing to lose our house over this? Because we might do that. Um, and so we say, yes, Jesus is worthy. We, we can lose our house wow. and he'll care for us. Uh, Raquel and I had to sit down and say, are we willing to lose our house over this? Because we might do that. Um, and so we say, yes, Jesus is worthy. We, we can lose our house wow. and he'll care for us. And then whenever there was threats of arrest, when they, when they served me that injunction, which, which the penalty for that was to be put in jail, uh, and knowing that James had spent 35 days in jail, are, are we ready for me to go to jail? Uh, and again, yes, Jesus is worthy. There, there is no amount of fine, no amount of jail time that is going to keep us from, from obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, through that time, God just strengthened our faith, strengthened our, our resolve, and then gave us so many brothers and sisters in our own church, uh, around the country, around the world, that were praying for us and, and encouraging us. And so uh, our faith certainly grew through that time and our resolve grew through that time. Yeah, indeed. I think Charles Spurgeon said, I'm certain that my, um, I'm certain that I never did grow in grace one half so much as I have upon the bed of pain. And mm-hmm. um, it is these trials that conform us more into the image of Christ and, and uh, make us lean harder on him. Right. Indeed. Brother, it was a, a heartbreaking video. One of the most heartbreaking videos I guess I've ever watched was the day that you were arrested the second time. Of course, first time you were just in jail with three days, but the second time was a uh, better part or more than more than two weeks, right? Yeah, 18 uh, days. Second 18 time. Day. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, two and a, two and a half weeks or so. And um, But to, to see your family... To, uh, your children huddled around you and Raquel and just, oh gosh, that just ripped my heart out. It's, it's not the civil magistrate's job, uh, the government's job to regulate or restrict our worship. And so we're really coming together, peaceful citizens, uh, to worship Christ because he is worthy. In terms of what that means now, I don't really know. The government has obviously uh, turned up the heat on churches, trying to discourage them from gathering together. I think they don't understand that Christians are committed to follow the Lord Jesus Christ regardless of the consequences. 
That's, that's different. Adam Sos here for Rebel News with a troubling update. Pastor Tim Stevens of Fairview Baptist Church has been arrested for proceeding with worship today. For those of you not familiar with Pastor Tim Stevens, he's nothing like Pastor Arthur Pawlowski. He's a quiet, reserved man who is simply leading his congregation in worship. He didn't make this a large political deal. He wasn't uh, an outspoken opponent to the authorities. He simply wanted to proceed with worship. Well, in Alberta, in this day and age, apparently that is not to be tolerated. So he was cornered today after worship by a large police force, he and his family. I just got off the line with our videographer, K2, who was on the scene, and he told me it was the hardest thing he has ever seen. What was um, what was that like for you, um, your family, the time that you were in prison, and uh, that your children? How did Raquel and your children deal? Just kind of walk us through some of the emotions of that day, and then the, your your time in jail. Yeah. Well, the, the Sunday before we had a great outdoor service, you know, we had, uh, because we were outside and, and not constrained by the space uh, of our building, uh, we had a number of people join with us and it was a great time of worship and fellowship together. We spent the day you know, outside together as a family of faith. Uh -huh. And then uh, on Monday, it was no Monday. We'd take Mondays a little bit slower uh, after a busy weekend. Sure. And I actually, I actually got a phone call right after lunch from my lawyer saying he's got word that the police are coming to arrest me. And uh, it gave me, it gave me a bit of a heads up. And so uh, he was able to contact uh, media, which is why people have been able to see that arrest uh, uh -huh. because a couple of reporters came uh, to film it. And so um, okay. he gave me a heads up. And so what we did, uh, we headed down to our living room and uh, you know, we were all in a bit of a blur about what was coming. The kids started to cry because they knew it was going to happen. And so we just sat down and we, uh, we enjoy singing psalms together as a family. So we we sang some psalms and we prayed together and, and essentially waited for the police to come. And, and then when the when the police came, just maybe 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes later after that phone call, uh, you could see some of the conversation uh, in that video that we had. We're just attempting to appeal to these men. I've sought to appeal to the police officers as they've come to give tickets, as they've come to serve me court injunctions, as they've come to, you know, to lock up our building. I sought to appeal to them because we have, we have a constitution in this country and, yeah. and that constitution protects religious freedom and assembly and a conscience. And, and those laws are, 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 are permanent, uh, not like temporary health orders. And okay. those health orders don't supersede the constitution. And so I sought to appeal to these men and, uh, and sadly, as even you, as I'm sure some of your viewers have saw in that video, uh, the police officer was s s trying to uh, instruct me with scripture about why we ought to obey to Caesar in this regard uh, and bow our knee to Caesar in this regard. Wow. And uh, so it's, it's certainly for a police officer like that, he's, he's hearing that from other pastors uh, who, who are telling him that uh, because of Matthew 18, two or three are gathered, but you don't have to be gathered together. You know, Zoom is fine and, and give, to, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I guess that includes wow. uh, the church as well and restrictions. So he was trying to instruct me on this. He was getting, he was getting that from other pastors. I could, I could only imagine yeah. that's what I mean. That's the from, assumption. Right? Yeah. That would be the natural. Wow. Because that's, that's the refrain of, of most churches here in our province. Yeah. Right. That's what they continue to say. 
uh, continue to appeal to Romans 13, can continue to appeal to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and this uh, the matters of public health are given to the government and not to the church. And uh, so we should close our doors. Uh, so, it, so it's incredible. So we, we, we tried to have a conversation with them um, to no avail. And so I, I wanted to try to comfort, comfort my family, uh, prayed with them again, you know, say goodbye to my wife and my children, uh, asking them not to, not to be angry at the police officers. Cause I, I know that's a temptation of our, of our older yeah. children uh, to be very yeah. angry uh, with the police officers. And yeah. so as they, as they then drove me to the arrest processing station, the police officer continued to appeal to me because I, I could, I could be a free man if I would agree to, with them that I would follow all health orders and I would not lead my church and gather with them to worship, but rather uh, if, if I followed all the limitations that the government imposed, uh, I could be home with my family. And so even, even going to, um, you know, the police station that afternoon and being in a cell, I had a police officer come by, I had other police officers uh, in the station there come in and try to appeal to me uh, to sign the papers saying that I'm going to agree so that I can go home with my family. Wow. And, I, and I tried to tell them I, I, I can't do that uh, because I, I can't agree that I, that I will disobey Christ. I can't agree that I will not pastor my church. I, I can't agree that I, I won't assemble and worship as Christ has called us to. Yeah. And uh, so they didn't think going to jail was worth it, but I said, it's no, no amount of, of, of threats and, and certainly jail time is the biggest threat and biggest punishment that our government can level against someone here. And uh, so I think they were just trying to use that to, to scare me and others into compliance. Um, but yeah. ultimately it shows, it shows that, uh, you know, these, these orders are unreasonable and they're willing to go to unreasonable lengths to try to uh, keep, keep their own authority intact. Uh, and, they, and they see pastors and, and churches as threats to their power and to their authority. And I think we see that in every culture, the proclamation that Jesus is Lord is a, uh, is a stench in the nostrils of tyrants. It's, uh, yes. it, it's hated yes. by, by people who seek to, to, to domineer and to rule people to right. say that there's another Lord that's above you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Indeed. Wow, brother. What a, oh my goodness. What a testimony to your faithfulness uh, to, to be given an oppor multiple opportunities, you know, just, Sign on the dotted line, and this will all be over. You know, it. it oh wow, uh, James. Uh, James had the same opportunity, and like he, right. he, he remained. He had to obey God rather than man. That's so, right. And, and one neat encounter out of that was one of one of the guards at the at the jail that I was in on Monday night before I was sent to the remand center, which is a, a longer term prison facility. Um, one of the guards there was, was chatting with me cause he heard I, I wasn't going to sign and uh, he was curious and his background is Roman Catholic, but I was able to share with him the gospel. And then I, again, after being presented an opportunity to sign and I, and I refused, which meant I was going to go to the remand center, you know, a much, a maximum facility prison. Uh, he was just astounded. He says, he says, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never seen, uh, someone so principled. And, uh, he, he was really, um, struck that I'd be willing to, to do this out of, out of obedience for Christ. And so it created a real impression upon him. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thankful for that. And I hope that I have opportunity to speak with that gentleman again, uh, that he would maybe come to church and, uh, and be oh, saved through that indeed. encounter. Indeed. indeed. Wow. That's uh, boy, if there's some way you have of getting in touch with him and inviting him to come to come to church. Wow. Well, well, James, that kind of, I mean, James, sorry, Tim, that kind of leads me, leads me into my next question. Um, tell us a little bit about your stay in prison. What was that like? And, um, you know, maybe the, maybe the environs and that kind of thing and the logistical stuff, uh, some of that, but also your, your interaction with the inmates. Right. Yeah. You now some of the, the, the cells that you're in, as, as you as you first of all are processed to get in there, uh, they're certainly they they lack any creaturely comforts, and yeah. uh, so it's a very uncomfortable place. And essentially, you go from cage to cage, uh, even when you're transported. It's 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 more like you're treated like an animal uh, when you're transported between different facilities and even to the courthouse or back. You know, they put you in full shackles. So uh, when I went from the police station, then later to the prison on Monday night, um, you know, I had I was had handcuffs and then chained down to those to my ankle shackles and tied up. And so uh, then they're being brought to a cell where where you where you wait, and then after that comes 
come to strip search. Uh, they do a scan of your body to make sure you're not carrying any drugs. And some of these things are, it's almost laughable um, that they just took me from my family or, or in May took me from my church and then would, would go through this process. But I understand they right. do it with everybody uh, as they come into this facility. So it, it's, it's very dehumanizing. It was very jarring when, when I went through that in May, uh, but in June going through the second time, it, you're, you're more prepared mentally as, as what is ahead and, yeah. and how you're treated by the guards. Um, because for the most part, the guards, uh, they treat you like any other criminal and, um, and so it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very dehumanizing process to go through. And when, when you get into your, your jail cell, it's very, very basic. You know, there's a, there's a, a small bunk bed on one side and there's a small little desk and a shelf on the other. And then there's a, a toilet that's just open into the room and uh, it's, it's a, it's a small space. So you don't have much space to either walk around or do, do anything much in there. And so you spend a lot of time on your bunk. And yeah. there's a very thin mattress there and they give you a few sheets and you have to use some sheets to cover you up for, for warmth and the other sheets you can roll up and use as a pillow. And, and that's about all you have for the first few days until you're able to, at every guard I asked uh, going into jail, I asked if I can get a Bible. And so eventually three days in, I was able to get a Bible, you know, asking for pen and for paper. And wow. so slowly, slowly you accumulate some of those things that become precious to you. So of all the things in prison that were precious to me was, was the Bible, was a notepad and a pen. Uh, so that, otherwise you, your, your mind is, is racing about all the things that you're thinking about. And, yeah. uh, and so to have pen and paper there to jot some of these things down is, is so very helpful. And then you're, you're in that cell, uh, especially because of COVID, there's a quarantine process you go through. So you're in that cell for, for 23 and a half hours a day. And so you come out for half an hour and you can, you can make a phone call. Uh, so I call my wife and, and you can have a sh shower during that time and talk to some of the other inmates. We have a very short time before you're back in and, and you never really know when you're going to come out. And so I never really know when I'm going to be able to talk to my wife next or, or find out more about what's happening to the church or uh, to the upcoming gathering on the next Lord's day or how long I'm going to be in there. Yeah. So one night, I, one day I know I was out at eight 30 in the morning for half an hour and then back in my cell. And then I wasn't out again till eight 30 PM the next day. And so, uh, and oh. my wife was just waiting, waiting for that phone call, waiting, waiting for me to call um, so that I could let her know what's going on. And so that was, that was difficult, just, just really not knowing what, what is coming the next hour, the next day, the next week uh, when you're in there. But one of, one of the blessings is getting to know some of the inmates. You don't have much interaction once you're in your cell and, and you're in a unit of cells. Um, once you're in there, you don't have much interaction with the guards. They sit behind a, a two-way mirror. They're in a bubble and they, they control everything with a push of a button and through the intercom. So you don't really have much interaction with them, yeah. but you do have interaction with your cellmates. And I had a cellmate the whole time and, and we had almost like a bit of a cohort as, as six of us really were checked into that prison around the same, same day or so. Yeah. And, uh, so I got to know some of these guys and, um, they, for the most part, the guys in prison, you know, they, they look rough, they look tough, they look mean. But then as you, as you begin to get to know them, you realize that these men, for the most part, are hurting men. They're, these are men who've had, had very tough pasts. Um, most, almost everyone that I met didn't have a father in their life. Uh, almost yeah. everyone that I met had, had, had drug addiction issues. Yeah. And so these, these men were just broken and hurting. And, uh, and, but they were so respectful to me and I've never seen so many tough guys, you know, cry as they begin to tell me their story. And as I sought to, to take gospel truth and apply it to them. So I, I, I was thankful for the opportunity to, to speak the gospel to people who are atheists, to people who are professing Christians, but obviously not living out that confession to the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. And, uh, so it was, uh, it was a great opportunity to, to be a pastor to these men, uh, on the inside um, who, who so desperately need the gospel and who so desperately need, you know, Christian truth to govern their relationships, um, and, and their life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I bet you had a, a lot of respect among those men. Um, yeah, that was, that was incredible. They all called me pastor or preacher um, is that right? when, they, when they began to know why I was in there. So I, I didn't meet one inmate. And as, as I went through and, and finished the COVID quarantine and, and being in a unit where you are out of your cell a bit more and you can interact with more guys, maybe, maybe 30 or 40 guys you can interact on your, on your free time. And uh, I had incredible respect from all of them. And yeah. there was uh, one young man in particular that I got to know. And, and I would uh, write letters to the inmates. Cause when you're in your cell, a lot, a lot of the day, 
uh, you're not, not able to speak to each other. So I would, I would write letters to them after hearing uh-huh. about them that we, they would have further scriptures to think about. Wow. And so I would write letters to these men. And there's one young man in particular who's uh, from another church in our, in our area. And uh, he's gotten into trouble with the law. And I was able to articulate to him, you know, true repentance. And because uh, he expressed a desire to repent and, and to leave this life of, of criminal activity. And so I was writing him about true repentance and about genuine faith in Christ and, and the beauty of Christ and the gospel. Yeah. And I, I know he treasured those letters and uh, he shared that with his family, with his pastor, who's since been in touch with me. And so they, they see this as, as an incredible example of God's providence uh, for putting him in jail at the same time that I was there, huh. that I might be a pastor to him and, uh, and serve him in that way and, uh, and, and encourage him to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that this would be a moment in his life that has led to a genuine change. The spirit of God has, has worked upon him and that he will live his life for the Lord fully uh, because yes. of this experience. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Well, that was a, a kind providence of God for that young man to, uh, to be there when you were there. So mm-hmm. yes, and that's, you know, kind of brings us around to Romans eight twenty eight. So, but, uh, <laughs> um, what was the brother, what was the reunion like, um, when you were, when you were released? The reunion was, was, was sweet. I, I know back in May when I came out, I was, I was a bit of a mess mentally, uh, to be honest, mm. uh, because of all the uh, things that were going on and then seeing with my family. And, and really when I was out in May, after being there three days, um, I, I, I did break down in front of my children yeah. and, uh, wept. And and they told my, my they told Raquel that like, we've never seen Daddy cry like that, and and I think the tears on that day, as I think about it, you know, some of them I, I couldn't necessarily explain all that was going on in my mind or in my heart, but I think part of the tears that I was shedding were because seeing the faces of my children, knowing that I I may be in prison longer, because not only are these restrictions still there, uh, but but there still might be coming convictions, including jail time uh, for, for my non-compliance, these health orders. And, and, and of course, in Canada, I'm sure you've heard they're seeking to, to ban, you know, conversion therapy, which would even include the pastors preaching and, and seeking to oh. preach against homosexuality and which includes, you know, five or seven years of a sentence in jail. And so as I looked at the faces of my children, my wife, I realized as I, as I sought to be faithful to Christ in our country, that I might be in jail for a long time. I might miss birthdays. I might miss milestones. Um, I might miss my kids growing up. And so that really overwhelmed me. Coming out of prison in June, um, through that time, because I had my notepad and my pen and I, and I sought to, uh, to be fervent in prayer through that time, I, and my prayer was, was every day, Lord, strengthen me, strengthen me. Mm. Um, and he, he answered that prayer. And I was able to write while I was in jail to our congregation and I was able to dictate it over the phone to Raquel and she would type it out. And, and so I was able to, to keep on writing letters to them from prison, write to our political leaders, uh, write, write to others um, on, on different topics while I was in jail, tried to continue to continue somewhat of a, of a public ministry while I was there. Yeah. And so I think that that really helped me uh, mentally to, to remain in the game and to remain um functioning as a shepherd and someone who's faithful to Christ, even through a time of trial. And so when I came out, I was, I was much more in a better spot. I, I came out and I was, I came out on a Thursday night and, and I wanted to preach. And uh, so I, mm. I told our assistant pastor who was ready to go for Sunday, I said, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm going to take the pulpit this Sunday because I have, I have a burden to preach. Um, and so I really desired to uh, just kind of hit the ground running when I came out of jail that second time because the Lord had so strengthened me. And I was so encouraged by, by hearing wow. how the Lord was building his church through my imprisonment and wow. how so many Christians, you know, wh- whether that, whether they were caring for an elderly parent and they were going through times of difficulty, like, because, because of your suffering, I, I'm, I'm resolved and I'm committed to serve in, in my time of difficulty and trial uh, in, in a way that, uh, that I, I didn't have before. And so because of this, I, w- I was just so excited uh, to just get out of there and, and to preach the gospel and to encourage our church. And yeah. uh, so, so I'm grateful for that. Amen, brother. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've told people before, you know, Paul says in second Timothy three, uh, 12 and 13, he, he says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And there are no exception clauses to that verse, unless you live in the United States or unless you live in Canada, unless you live in the Western world, there's no exception clauses to that. And, and oftentimes we think of persecution as something happening to someone in a, you know, in a Soviet country or North Korea or something like that. But if, uh, if, if you're living godly in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. Um, maybe not to the extent that you have, but then again, maybe. Uh, and one sure way to escape persecution is to not live godly in Christ Jesus. I mean, you can call yourself a Christian and not live godly in Christ Jesus and avoid persecution. So you might escape the persecution, but you're not going to escape the, the watchful eye of Christ. That's right. And in our, in our country, there's been a number of Christian leaders um, writing publicly and speaking publicly that what's, what's happening to the church in Canada today is not persecution. And uh, it's, it's <laughs> quite incredible to me because it seems contrary to what you just quoted from Scripture. Right. And what, what has been incredible to Raquel and I is we've received letters from Christians in China, in Iran, and in North Korea saying they're praying for the persecuted church in Canada. And so really? I, I know I know in those countries there is a, a difference of degree in terms of the persecution they're experiencing, yeah. Um, yeah. but yet it it is still persecution when the state seeks to define what it what it means to obey Christ and what worship looks like and and what the church can and can't do, and so yeah. they, they recognize it. And so when we have believers in those countries praying for us here, uh, we we begin to just scratch our heads and and ask where are we. That, that Christians in those countries are praying for us. You yes. Know? Yes. No kidding. And like you said a minute ago, the, the Canadian government is already considering it's the things are already kind of in the work, so to speak, of banning conversion therapy. And, and I can conceivably see in the not too distant future at all where, um, yeah, you could, you could face you and other faithful pastors and an emphasis on faithful shepherds, faithful pastors, could face imprisonment simply for preaching the gospel itself, simply for, for preaching what the Bible has to say about homosexuality in Romans 1 or, or 1 Corinthians 6 telling um, a homosexual that, that through faith in Christ and repentance from sin, you could join the for such were some of you crowd. That's right. I mean, you, That's you right. could be, go ahead. No, I, I say, and, and through this time, you know, James Coates and myself would, would be in our province, at least, you know, public enemy number one for those, um, you know, part of the, the whole LGBTQ um, yes. activism crowd yes. who, are, who are seeking to, to destroy, you know, Christian values and, and beliefs. Um, so, so pastors like ours who are like us, who are now in the limelight, um, certainly we're going to be targets for their complaints when this law becomes um, becomes criminal, um, when, it, when it passes it. Right now it's in our Senate. So as soon as we made law, and then it'll be a crime uh, to, to preach biblical ethics and, and sexuality, which is, which is, again, incredible. Right, right. And, and even here in the United States, I, you know, it seems like the United States culturally, socially, maybe is lags behind Canada, maybe 10 or 15 years. But, you know, we always seem to catch up to where, to where you guys were <laughs> 10 or 15 years ago. But even now, uh, a few months ago, I was preaching at a church in, um, in Idaho, and uh, we had a Q&A session, and, and there was a question given to me, several questions actually basically related to, what do I do as an employee working at such and such a company or business when they require me to refer to a man who thinks he's a woman as a she and if I don't refer to this person in his, his or her, whatever preferred pronouns, then I could lose my job. What do, as a Christian, what do I do then? And that's like, well, there's your, there's your test, right? I mean, you, you can't refer to a man who thinks he's a woman as a woman. Uh, you're doing that man no favors. You, you refer to him as what he is or her to what she is. You know, it's, 
And so these things are already kind of coming into play where we're going to face maybe not what you have faced and James have faced as, as pastors, but uh, just from, um, you know, we could lose our jobs over bending to the culture and, and denying biblical realities of male and female and that kind of things. And, and, and these things are tests, right? Test of our faith. That's right. That's right. No, I was say because it's it's happened before with with whether that's wedding photographers or bakers, you yeah. know, it, right. it's, it's it's gonna it's gonna continue whether whether you're in the United States or in Canada or another Western country. There is there is an onslaught by our governing authorities who are, who are looking for more of a of a bigger government. And again, uh, Christianity is seen as something that that is enemy number one, and, and the values around Christianity. And so uh, th- there's there's a denial that uh, Christianity and the gospel is really what has led to the freedom and the prosperity we enjoy in our countries, and, yes, and they're seeking exactly. to destroy all of that. And uh, and if and if God doesn't uh, grant a change of course in our countries, it'll it'll go from bad to worse, and it will lead to bondage to our people, lead to heartache, uh, broken families, and then it's, it's more and more uh, of a police state as uh, as no longer are we governed by by the Holy Spirit or, or by, by God's law upon our heart, but rather uh, an increased uh, state presence would need to try to establish some kind of law and order in our, in our countries. And it's just going to be to the, the detriment of the people. And, and really, where, where, where do you flee? Because I, mean, I know many Canadians who are, who are looking to a state such as yours or other states uh, down to the south, and they, they enjoy hearing what's going on in Florida or Texas, and they, they want to move down there. Um, yeah. But uh, I, th- I think really what we need to see is is uh, more gospel preaching, more 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 the word of God, stronger churches, and that's one thing that's been been sad through this time is is the the weakness in our churches uh, to stand for truth uh, during during this time when it when it seems uh, very clear that the government is is going beyond well, their biblical mandate and is actually defining worship, and uh, so so. It, I would love to see the, the church um, come to repentance and strengthen through this time, which would then have a positive impact on, on, on everyone, uh, whether Christian or non, in, in the countries that we live in. Yes, indeed. Amen. Gospel preaching. That's the power of God and salvation. And that's, that, there's the power of God. Uh, Tim, you shared with me last night when we were talking on the phone that um, even though you're out of prison and you're back home with your family and you're, uh, you're meeting with your church. Um, you're not out of the woods yet, legally speaking. So, uh, and I think maybe a lot of people think that you are just because you're home, but you're not, as you explained to me last night. So what, um, where do things stand with you with the ongoing legal issues? What are you facing? Yeah. When I, yeah, when I came out of, when I came out of jail on July 1st, um, of course, the, the congregation, my family was very pleased, and I, and I had to, to tell them that uh, I'm still in a lot of trouble, and I am still in a lot of trouble. I have uh, a criminal charge against me because uh, of breaking that court order. They, they decided to charge me criminally uh, for breaking that court order, and so that is still an outstanding charge against me. And so I have I have court dates coming up at the end of this month uh, to, to further that process down the road. I have I have six or seven. I believe public health act violations against me, which again, carry fines up to hundred thousand or 500,000 for repeat offenses. And so uh, a, a huge monetary possible penalty uh, if, if I'm convicted of those charges. And so the, these things still, still loom ahead of us. Our, our government has, has dropped a number of, of tickets against individuals here in our province. Um, but yet they're still moving forward uh, with myself and with James, with others, uh, who, have, who have defied them and have been more, I guess, public uh, or in, in our in our defiance or non-compliance uh, to their health orders. Yeah. So it really remains to be seen, and and, and it's the the legal system is is by no means quick, and it's not quick in our country. And uh, so, both James Coates and I are are waiting to see what is going to take place. We're we're both represented by the same lawyer and the same legal team, okay. and uh, they understand where we're coming from, which which we're thankful for. And so it's uh, it's just a matter of time to see as as the constitutionality of some of these public health orders hopefully are are, are weighed in court and and we, we pray that the judges would would judge justly and, and not just simply side with the government because they're the government 
And so it re- remains to be seen what the, what the possible penalties may be, but it, it could include not only a substantial financial penalty and sanction, but it, it could include jail time as well. And so that's, that's still in the future that I might go back to jail uh, because of defying these public health orders. Wow. So as of right now, the, the churches can meet, right? I mean, those, those restrictions have been lifted, but you still face penalties, both financial and possibly imprisonment for regulations that were previously in place, but are not in place now. That's right. We have, we have no, no restrictions on, on gatherings now in Alberta. Um, and so the, 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 the sanctions or the possible convictions that I'm, I'm facing are for violations of, of health orders that were, were previously existing when we, when we gathered, because there, there were, there were times here when we continue to gather when, when the, the outdoor limit was 10, uh, when, when the indoor limit for churches was 15 people and, uh, and we gathered as, as a full congregation. So, um, and, and the police have, have documented evidence of that, uh, counting people who are going in, going out uh, of our facility and so it's it's those those past actions that they're seeking still to prosecute. Um, and actually, when I was in in jail in June, there was there was one Monday when they called me out of my cell and and uh, and brought me to a visiting area there. And there was a police officer there, and he issued me another ticket, well, another um, court summons while I was in jail. And uh, I asked what that was for, and it was for uh, violations of public health orders uh, between January and March. And so they're still going back to some of those services that they haven't issued me a ticket for sure. and, and continue to issue me tickets. Um, so at, at this point, and, and just seeing some of the correspondence from the prosecution lawyers, uh, at, at this point, it seems like they're out for blood, uh, that they're, they're really angered uh, at people like myself or James. And uh, it, it seems like they're intent on, on bringing the full weight of the law against us. Um, even though the the so-called crisis is is over now unreal unreal well brother please know that we will be praying for you we will be praying for you and raquel and your your children uh for you for james coates uh, for your for your churches and and the other faithful shepherds uh there in canada as you face this uh you know, I, I don't know if you've heard me say this before or not. Uh, I'm, I'm an evangelist. I travel and preach. In fact, you and I have met before uh, that you reminded me last night. We met before uh, several years ago up in Canada. I was preaching up there. But, uh, you know, as an evangelist, there are certainly challenges in, in what I do, but I don't face the kind of challenges that a pastor faces. And um, I am so profoundly grateful for all of our faithful shepherds out there that are laboring away. They don't have the big platform that, you know, they're not being asked to speak at the big conferences or, but there's so many of you faithful shepherds out there. So many of you guys, and I'm so grateful for what you do. I'm so, what, what a tremendous calling, what an important work you have. Um, It's going to be guys like you one day and, and all the other faithful shepherds that nobody knows about. Um, unknown to anyone except to their local churches and the good shepherd himself, but it's going to be you guys. One of these days, it's going to be at the front of the line. And um, I, I really do. Thank you, brother. Amen. And, and that's one of the blessings that I've received through this time is, is getting to know other faithful pastors across our country and around this world yeah. uh, who have the same convictions. And, uh, and like you yeah. said, so many of them, nobody knows. They've never been a, a newspaper article about them. They've never uh, been right. brought into the spotlight, yeah. uh, but they're laboring and, and their church congregations are thriving because they have a, have a man who's leading them, who believes God's word and is willing to, 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 to live that out. And, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for the, for the friendships I've made through this time uh, with these other faithful men. So amen, amen to that. Amen, indeed. Amen, indeed. Tim, is there anything, uh, in a, in a, aside from praying, in addition to praying in a more tangible way that, that we can do to help you, help your family, help your church? Is there anything tangibly that we can be doing for you, brother? 
Well, we are, we are well loved by our church family. Um, you know, R- Raquel didn't make a single meal when I was in jail. Uh, so we, we, we were well loved by them and people have been, been sending us gifts uh, from, yeah. from, from all over the world. And so we were overwhelmed by the amount of support we were receiving. And I'm still opening mail that, that uh, was sent to me weeks ago. And what's astounding about the mail is, is as I open up people's mail, even though I'm reading it a few weeks later than when, when they writ, wrote it or intended it for me, yeah. uh, so many of the things that they wrote in there that they were praying for me, I saw how God was answering their, their prayers uh, those weeks that they were praying, I, I, the scriptures that they included uh, were the same scriptures that were going through my mind, um, even as they were writing it and sending that mail to me. So I'm I'm so thankful for the support that we received. It's, it's been overwhelming, uh, just how many people have been praying for us and writing to us. And so um, we have we have no needs, but I'd, I'm just so very thankful. And there's so many out there that I can't even thank. So if, mm-hmm. if you are watching this and you have you have encouraged us in some way, then I, I'm I I so thank God for you, and and I praise God for you, and how you've encouraged uh, our church and our family. Amen, amen, brother Tim. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so very much. Uh, it's been an honor and privilege to to have you on the program. And um, thank you again for your faithful witness. And um, you and I will stay in touch. I want to keep, I want to get updates from you as, as how these things progress, at these things that you're still facing. And uh, Lord willing, yep. would love to see you again in person. Yes, we'll have to plan that out. And so thank you so much, Justin, yeah, for having me and for, uh, for, for sharing this story and being a faithful gospel minister and uh, being faithful and speaking the truth because uh, we, we so desperately need it in this day and age. And so I appreciate all that you do uh, for the Lord and may the Lord continue to, to bless you and to bless the ministry. Thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate that. We have an audience of one, right? One That's person. right. Yeah. All right. Well, dear ones, thank you very much for joining me. I trust that this was an encouragement to you. It certainly was to me both an encouragement and maybe even a little bit of a rebuke as well. So uh, thank you very much for watching and tell our, be, be sure to pray for Tim, Raquel, his family, James and Aaron and their families, their churches. Um, okay, dear ones. Well, that was the interview. I hope that it was an encouragement to you. And even if I may be so bold as to say for some For some churches, uh, I hope that this was a challenge, even up to a gentle, loving rebuke, because I know uh, a lot of churches did shut down. I understand almost every church shut down for, you know, at least a month or so until we kind of figured out what we were dealing with, you know, in the early stages of COVID. But uh, then once, even after we began to see that it was not nearly as serious as, as what we initially thought, Many, many churches remained shut down for months on end, uh, up to a year, and some of them are still shut down. And um, uh, some churches have made the excuse of, well, we don't want to, we're not going to open up because we don't want to get on the wrong side of the government and, and, and risk having the government come and shut us down. We have a command from Christ. We have a command from Christ to meet to not forsake the assembling of ourselves. And, uh, you know, this if, if we can't stand up and do what churches are supposed to do in a season like this, what in the world are we going to do when real persecution does come? And, and I'm talking about Iran kind of persecution, North Korea kind of persecution. Then what are we going to do? Uh, you know, the only objective measure that we have of our love for Christ is our obedience to Christ. That's a loose quote from John MacArthur. Our love for Christ is not based upon feelings and emotions. And I'm not not against our feelings and emotions being engaged by the truths of Scripture. In fact, I would be afraid of the fella whose feelings and emotions are not engaged by the profundity of who Christ is. But you know, feeling good or, or having warm, fuzzy thoughts or getting, you know, goosebumps on our arms or that, that's not an, that's not how we measure our love for Christ. We measure our love for Christ by our obedience to Christ. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. John fourteen twenty one. So um, I do hope this was an encouragement and possibly even a challenge slash loving 
rebuke, if applicable. All right, dear ones, thank you very much for watching. Until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. All right. Brother, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Justin. Yeah. That, was, that was great. I appreciated that. And uh, it's great to be able to share with another like-minded brother. And, uh, and, I, and part, part of my wish is that if, if, if persecution continues to come in this nature against, uh, against the church, that, uh, that the Lord would still be pleased to put a couple brothers in jail together, that we might sing songs and praise together, just like Indeed. Paul and Silas. And, and uh, it'd yep. be a sweet time of fellowship. <laughs> it sure would, brother. It sure would. If it comes to that, I, in fact, I've already been praying uh, for that, not every day, but, uh, but I pray Lord, if it ever come, does come to that, please let me have a, a like-minded brother I can share a cell with or, or at least be yes. in the same facility with, that would be a great encouragement. So. Yes. Yes, for sure. They come to that. I was talking to Paul Washer a couple months ago and he and I were talking about all these kind of things. And, and he said, brother, we may be doing prison ministry together. <laughs> it's like, we may be. So. Yes. Now with, uh, with, the, with the way things are headed, because uh, I think American politics are probably uh, watched more in Canada than Canadian politics are. And so we've, mm. we've been tracking how things have been degenerating, you know, south of our border. Yeah. And uh, it, it seems like the, the, the next decade is going to be very interesting uh, what the Lord might do for his yeah. church and for his people. And so, I'm thankful that we have a book and then we're called to be faithful and preach that book. And so uh, in one sense, our job is easy, even, right. even though the, the, the foundations are being sh shaken around us. Right. Um, so I'm, 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 I take comfort in that. <laughs> Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Sovereignty of God. What a comforting doctrine. Yes. And that when they brought you that Bible in prison, it wasn't a, it wasn't the message, was it? <laughs> no. No, it was, it, it was actually the, the NLT. So it wasn't, it okay. wasn't my favorite. Uh, it wasn't terrible, but uh, you know, you know enough scripture that as you, as you read through it, you realize, okay, they're taking some liberties of this passage yeah, that I don't right. agree with. And then uh, Raquel actually made an Instagram post asking people to, to send scripture and uh, said that my preferred translation was the ESV. So yeah. I, I ended up getting most of the Bible in the ESV uh, oh. through letters <laughs> that people sent. So good <laughs> that was good yeah good. good deal good deal brother all right well tim uh i've enjoyed it thank you so much and um i'll be working on editing putting some little edits in this and stuff for be working on that tonight and hopefully we'll have this posted maybe tomorrow um okay would you like me to post a link to your church's website sure that'd be great and then you can okay. just uh just let me know when it's online because i'm uh there's a lot of a lot of folks in our church uh, that uh, that would love to see it as well, and, and I know you have uh, you have a lot of people in our church that follow your ministry and appreciate what you do. So they'll they'll be excited to hear that uh, that you and I were able to have a conversation. Oh, good, so, good. Yeah. Well, well, tell them hello for me. Yeah, I will. <laughs> All right. All right, my friend. God bless you, brother. All right. Thank you, Justin. Take Thank care. You. you too. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.